Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Gastola. I am a journalist, but I'm also a lover of movies, and I'm here to do a debut segment, something I'm going to be doing more of on the channel. And there's a revamping going on, um, reworking this. We're developing uh, the membership, the subscribers, growing the subscribers. And part of doing that is going to be doing some segments on film and so basically i put together this show uh where i'll talk about some upcoming releases that i'm looking forward to that i think maybe people who follow my work or who are engaged in some of the issues that i engage in might find interesting um but this is really a show uh about me at the end of the week i get to unload and uh to, to, you know have a time and space to do something other than bury my face in many of the most pressing issues that are out there. I'm not losing sight of them. And then I'll get to a big story from the past week. So uh, let's get right to it uh, as, a, as a buzzsaw goes on and on outside my window. Uh, let's get right to it. So here. Uh, uh, there's a film coming out from Gareth Edwards uh, that caught my attention. Uh, maybe you saw it. The trailer premiered. This is John David uh, Washington, and uh, he is the son of Denzel Washington. And uh, Gareth was the director for Rogue One. He made a very good indie film called Monsters that came out around 2010, 2011. It's excellent uh, film. So we've got this movie coming in the end of September called Creator. And what it has to do with is the rise of artificial intelligence. Now, I don't know how it's going to maybe give us something more than what we've seen in the simplicity of Ex Machina, um, even Megan, uh, the from the beginning of the year, is an excellent excellent example of dealing with the issues that artificial intelligence presents. Uh, but this one has this Armageddon feel to it. There's a kind of apocalypse. Uh, the uh, a, nu a nuke is set off by artificial intelligence that was developed to basically protect humanity. Of course, it's turned on humans, as is the storyline for a lot of these films. But the but the the, the cast uh, includes Ken Watanabe. And uh, as you can see on the screen there, uh, you see in the preview that was put out that John David Washington comes upon this child. The child turns out to be this weapon uh, that the artificial intelligence that has revolted against humanity are, are going to use. Um, and it's up to uh, human beings to take out this weapon that has presented itself as a child. And, uh, and then as you can see here in, in this image, uh, there, there are these visually stunning set pieces, Industrial Light and Magic worked on it. Industrial Light and Magic, the house that a lot of the Star Wars movies, so they have a connection to Rogue One. So as I watch this preview, I really see a lot of, of that. But of course, it's coming from the style of Gareth Edwards, who was uh, the writer. Um, and then his, the co-writer on this was also uh, a writer who was involved on Rogue One as well. So this thing is um, a film, and I, I do wonder how it'll be considered alongside Dune Part 2. Um, it has some epic qualities to it, uh, but I'm looking forward to this. And then another film that is on my radar that I'm very interested in sitting down to watch is Reality, which is about NSA whistleblower reality winner. And uh, this is something that in my work as a journalist, I've covered extensively. The writer for this movie, um, this is coming to HBO Max at the end of May, I believe. And hopefully it does well enough so that it's not purged and removed. But uh, reality, uh, this movie was written by 
Tina Satter. And Tina is a playwright and she's from New York. And I had the opportunity to meet her when I went to uh, Michigan uh, University in Ann Arbor. And this was just before the pandemic. I had an opportunity to go there and see this play performed called Is This a Room? And it's a verbatim transcript that is used as the script for the play. And there are two agents, uh, the two FBI agents who came and engaged in the interrogation. They're in this movie. Uh, the cast, uh, the people who play these characters are Josh Hamilton. And then you have, uh, his name is Marshawn Davis. And Marshawn Davis is actually someone who was in a film that highlighted FBI abuse uh, back in 2017 uh, or 2019, sorry, 2019. It was called The Day Shall Come. And this was about the Liberty City 7 in Florida, a very uh, notorious case and example of what happened there when basically these uh, black men, young impoverished black men were entrapped by the FBI. So he's in this. And in fact, actually, Josh Hamilton uh, was in J. Edgar. Uh, so now they are playing FBI agents and they are the ones that do the interrogation of reality. And the script is word for word, although there might be some embellishments in the movie that I don't know about yet, but the, the movie essentially is based upon the FBI transcript that was obtained. Uh, this was this was released. Uh, the audio uh, was released to Sonia Kennebec, a documentary filmmaker who made a movie um, up on Reality Winner. So we've got the documentary that's been out there. Um, I always prefer the documentary to the film that is being, uh, 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 that is a, a narrative representation, um, a more artistic representation. But, but that being said, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how they do this. It's a play being brought to the screen. So you always wonder how that's going to translate. There's a lot of interpretive um, and, and creativity to the way that uh, she blocks all of her actors on the stage. Uh, and some of it is it does not lend itself to the screen uh these would be very abstract and so now uh it has to be more formal it has to look more realistic and i'm looking forward to seeing how that is presented in this movie and this is the photo that is fairly well known it's it's circulated this is of reality winner outside of her house in augusta georgia where she works she was an nsa contractor and Sydney Sweeney plays reality winner. That's who oh, we've been seeing. Sydney, known for her work in HBO's Euphoria. Uh, and so this is sort of like content being kept in house, you could say, although I don't know if that was intended. But uh, Sydney is there posed and looks like that photo that we've seen uh, because the FBI is out there um, taking a photograph of her. And that, that brick house, I visited this brick house in Augusta, Georgia, while covering this case. Uh, but I get back to these upcoming releases. As I said, you could see this at the end of May. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Here's a fantastic adaptation that I think is coming. And uh, let me just pause for a moment and say thank you, Billy for chiming in. Billy's the mother of Reality Winner, um, lets me know that the documentary was updated under the title of Reality Winner, and it'll have interviews with Reality Winner. So in addition to this film, we have an upcoming documentary, a revamp of the documentary, um, and then uh, we also have uh, another film. There's a second Hollywood film of Reality Winner that is, is coming as well. So you can look forward to that. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I really encourage whistleblower stories. I'm this program, the segment that I do is definitely going to be boosting any kinds of films that are upcoming that are strong, uh, inspirational whistleblower stories. Uh, so 
going back to this. So Killers of the Flower Moon. Here's a film coming from Martin Scorsese, obviously uh, a titan in movies and uh, with an indigenous cast, a, a, a really a strong indigenous cast that are going to bring to life this story from David Gran that was written in the book was called The Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. So this is the FBI at its infancy in the 1920s. Um, we see that these indigenous people, the Osage, are being terrorized because underneath the land that they own are oil deposits, are reserves, that there are white people in Oklahoma that they would like to get their hands on this oil. So the indigenous people, um, and this is, this is Lily Gladstone, who is an indigenous actor, and she has been in Reservation Dogs, Billions, Certain Women, a film by Kelly Reichhardt. Um, and so here she is. Um, she's a central character going through what is happening around her as the people of uh, th this tribe are being murdered. And the FBI comes in. Again, it's in its infancy. And it's dealing with uh, you know, th these characters here. The, the character that De Niro is playing is a villain and there's Brendan Fraser who looks to be his attorney potentially. And we get a shot in the trailer, the preview for this film that came out this past week. Uh, this is the first glimpse that we got this first uh, teaser and we see this kind of mayhem happening. Um, it looks like people are being beaten up, uh, riots, uh, I vaguely remember the book. I read the book. It was gripping. I'm going to have to revisit the book in order to probably appreciate the Killers of the Flower Moon fully. Uh, but Leonardo DiCaprio is uh, the lead, I think, that's going to be sort of opposite of Lily Gladstone in the film, her character. And... Uh, like I said, this this movie is just the way that the teaser is laid out has this very ominous, gripping. Uh, these are all white oligarch type people and they're staring in the camera and Leonardo DiCaprio is reading from a book and says, can you spot the wolves in this picture? Or he says, can, yeah, can, can you, yeah, can you name the wolves in this picture? Can you see the, the wolves in this picture? And it's very chilling uh, the way that these words are looped in the teaser. And so right there, I'm in. I'm in for this movie. I was already in because of the all-star cast that was assembled because of the representation that it's going to bring to indigenous actors, which, you know, in another segment here i'll probably do something about the cast that was assembled but but there you go those are the three films and i'll move on to the story that i have for today uh, which is what we're seeing with disney and the streaming service that they operate uh, deciding that they're going to purge dozens of series from the platform from hulu uh, these, this is content that people, human beings worked on, artists worked on. Maybe it doesn't speak to you. Maybe it isn't the most compelling as any of the artwork or any of the productions that I just uh, hyped. But, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be Mr. Waffles goes to the moon. It could be some, uh, you know, whimsical, goofy story uh, lots of it is for children. No matter what you think of the individual titles, there were people who worked hard in order to produce this and to see that um, a multi-billion dollar corporation that rakes in so much money is just going to remove it so people don't have any access to it anymore is, well, we're going to get to what it is because there have been some really visceral reactions from the writers who right now are on strike. So I think we connect the two stories. It's pretty audacious for Disney to push forward with this. It shows 
uh, what they believe they can get away with uh, because the Writers Guild strike is in its third week and they're going forward and taking down all of this content um, and, and fueling what is this new way of managing artists. And I think it presents a kind of dark future for the way we consume entertainment. And so uh, if you, we go back here, uh, I've got this deadline article that has been circulated widely that has spotlighted the kind of shows, uh, the willow, which was uh, a TV series that picked up after this cult film from Lucasfilm in 1980s. Uh, it is, that's one that has really caught people's attention. This was a darling of Warwick Davis and all kinds of other people to bring it back. It got canceled before they could do another season and bring back Val Kilmer's character, although he's been struggling. Um, and I don't know if his health and you know what he has to deal with now would have lent itself to a cameo, but they were certainly going to try, similar to how they brought him back for the Top Gun sequel. But you have things like Big Shot, Turner, Turner and Hooch. Mighty Ducks, again, was this kind of like nostalgic, uh, going back to uh, the film with Emilio Estevez. And then you've got these other things there. And I'm surprised to see that the world, according to Jeff Goldblum, is being yanked. Um, and you've got Little Demon being yanked. You've got all these shows uh, and... They'll claim that they're short-lived series, they're specials or direct-to-streaming movies that didn't do very well. Um, but what's important is that there were artists involved with these. And, and you see in this article from Deadline, an agent describing what it means to have exposure on these streaming services, what streaming was supposed to represent, where even if you weren't getting paid well and you didn't have a lot of money that was coming in from residuals, you at least had this exposure that somebody could stumble upon this. When I opened any of these streaming services at the end of my long day, working on an article, working on putting together a news report, when I kick back and spend a couple hours unwinding, I have an opportunity to maybe find this person's work. I don't know. I'm probably not going to watch the kids shows that some of these people worked on, but over on HBO max, I might find something new on Hulu. I might some find something new and I can't do that. If the, I can't really find something that might be fresh and different that nobody's really talking about. If Disney and uh, uh, HBO max or Warner media or whatever is going to remove these, before we get to find these kind of, I guess you call them the diamonds in the rough or something that speaks to you, that they have like idiosyncrasies that make you happy. You know, other people aren't watching it, but you know, you find something in it that is entertaining to you. And you can't do that anymore, I suppose, because I guess the stakes are so high now or the way that these uh, capitalistic, greedy enterprises are going to behave is that you can't just list these on a streaming service anymore. So it's even further away from what it was like to go to a video store and go through the selections and pick out what you wanted. And so deadline um, in this uh, article that I encourage you to go read the streaming purge if you're interested in what's going on in the industry. Uh, there was a wave of library content removals that have been ongoing in the past year. A couple of writers worked on this. You can find this at Deadline. So who decides which shows are getting the boot, they ask. Well, it's bean counters, mostly who consider the cost of carrying library content based on how much is paid toward residuals, participations, and royalties. That is weighed against viewership and a title's ability to lure more subscribers. So again, like the writers the producers, the directors, the actors, the people who are involved in these projects don't matter. And it's all about money, money, money and underperforming. And 
sometimes not even given a chance to perform. You know, what we're going to see here is that when we're talking about Willow, that's a six month old show. And they're deciding after that short amount of time that it's a failed show and it should be removed from the platform. So um, I'm going to go and pull up some of the tweets that I have set aside for the final part of this. Well, first, let's look at what John Bickerstaff is saying. He's a writer and he's on strike. And he said of Willow, because he was a writer on that show, they gave us six months, not even. The business has become absolutely cruel. And before you say tax write-offs, because that's something that has been said about how this entire process works, before you say tax write-offs, he says, you should know that these shows have already been released and they can't be written off. And in the case of Willow, they own the property outright. The only conclusion that this is to get out of paying residuals during a strike. So they don't want to pay writers and they're removing these shows and the excuses that they're not performing well. And in a public that doesn't know how the business works, they're relying on our ignorance. And they're also relying on the fact that maybe we didn't watch the show. We don't care about the show. So they're going to be able to remove it without us getting angry. And then John adds, and look, internal streaming libraries are not sustainable. We're all going to have to adjust to that at some point. But to spend, and he doesn't say how much was spent on a show, and then disappear it six months later is just bad business. I don't know if maybe he's not allowed contractually to say how much was spent, but it really doesn't matter. You make up your dollar figure, and then they just yank it. I mean, what it, what, what are we doing here? This it really doesn't make sense. It's pretty senseless. And so uh, let me go to another tw uh, another reaction here that caught my attention that I think is important. These, these reactions I've collected here, they're coming from writers that are impacted. My first episode of TV is being wiped from the streamer after only six months. And, and, and Brittany Jang says this blows. They worked on Big Shot. Uh, I believe that's the show with John Stamos. Before there were DVD box sets to have as a keepsake. Now it will be as if it never existed. Um, here's another one I'll pull up here for you. I find these to be outrageous. I find what they're doing to be rather infuriating. And I'm not even someone who created a show for these platforms. I wrote on both seasons of the Mysterious Benedict Society, some of my proudest work. This is an Emmy nominated screenwriter. Um, I believe his name is James and, or, uh, and he, my nephews just became the right age to really enjoy it. My sister, a teacher shows episodes to her students. As long as it's streamable, I get paid, but now it will be gone forever. Again, this is all just about not paying people. So what I can get into here is uh, a little bit further explanation that comes from Benjamin uh, Simon, who is, or Seaman, he's a TV writer. Um, he's worked on uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, and he gets into this. Studios remove series from streaming to avoid paying writers and actors insanely tiny amounts of residuals. It's why writers and actors have to strike so we can afford to make any kind of living supplying the stories and talent that makes studios billions. Um, so... Uh, just quickly, I'll, I'll run through these without putting them on the screen. There's Eliza Clark here who says, well, you work on something for years, pour your heart out and soul into it as do hundreds of other artists. You make it during a global pandemic far from home. Then it is canceled before it even has a chance to finish airing. And then it is disappeared. Um, and it's as if it never happened. It's as if nobody ever worked on the show at all. And how do you tell people what you did? How do you tell people what you were working on and how do you get future work if you can't point to where it is? And if it's no longer on the platform, maybe that looks like you're the reason why or you're responsible. Who's going to take a risk on you and give you another show 
And how do you get future paid work if the past work has been pulled from the platform? I would think I could see studio executives treating that as like a demerit against you that like there's something negative about you that that has happened. And so this is, this is, this is awful. And I think it points to why we still have to hold on to the physical if we can, but I don't know how that's possible. What's been pointed out is these shows being removed, all these streaming services that are purging because of these executives that have taken over these greedy billionaire executives that are just concerned about squeezing the most maximum amount of profits and also turning the screws on writers and other people and, and not paying them more as they are on strike is that you can't go anywhere and get these. There's no physical copies to buy of these shows. And so while you used to maybe in the past, there would have been some way that the studios could control distribution of these shows, uh, could stop syndicating it. There was at least the possibility that, Maybe you would have a DVD or you could have a VHS copy of this and you could watch it when you wanted to. And that would still mean that your work was in circulation to some degree. You could find it. You might be able to go find it at a thrift store, other places like that. It could be sold at auctions. Um, it could be Maybe you'd find it on eBay. Who knows? There's stores that sell these. But how are you supposed to ever get people to see this when it's under lock and key, your know, Disney's going to take this content and they're not going to make it available to anyone. And how do you pirate? Well, so now you say, well, maybe the pirates will save these writers. Maybe the fact that Disney is going to try to pull, put this away, there's going to be people who go and make it available for illegal downloads. Well, I don't know if you could get away with that. Uh, the technology is so far advanced that they might be able to stop it from being shared. And I don't know, does anybody want to take the risk of being in trouble for internet piracy? Uh, we're 10, 15, 20 years beyond what it was like when Napster first came on the scene and uh, people were first dealing with the phenomenon of internet piracy. So I don't know if that can be some kind of saving grace for writers, even though that's not what they would want, because they would want people to legitimately access and watch their content. But this happens amidst a writer's strike. And I believe no matter what you perceive as far as the politics of the people who work in this, you have to have working class solidarity with those who are working in these spaces. Um, endorsing them does not necessarily mean that you endorse the projects that they work on. And uh, and I, I would say that you've watched something in the past year or two that was done by somebody in the Writers Guild. And if it gave you relief, if it gave you a break from the slogs, the grind of life, then you owe it to support what the writers are doing. So I'll conclude um, this with, I want to show uh, James Mangold, who is the director of the, for, uh, the up and coming Indiana Jones Dial of Destiny. And he was at the Cannes Film Festival and he was asked uh, during the press conference about the writer's strike. I think it was a vaguely worded question. He wasn't quite sure what he was expected to say about the strike, but he did say some kind words of solidarity for writers. He is a writer. He worked on this film, I think to some extent, and so here is the uh, comments that he gave. People and trying to get to the end. Um, in terms of the WGA, I'm not sure what the question is. Of course, we're not writing now, but the uh, but it was you know no movie happens without a great script, and no great script happens without writers. And um, and and writers are often um, because they're first in the process. They're often also first to be forgotten. Um, and, and I think that is true in so many parts of the business. So I support them in their struggle to get what, what could be fair for everybody. So thank you. Uh, thank you for tuning in. 
Uh, if you are still around, uh, if you're watching this video after it's been archived, after we streamed, or if you're here right now, make sure you're subscribed. Maybe join the channel. There's going to be uh, member-only content here. Uh, if you're subscribed to my Dissenter newsletter and uh, you want access to this, uh, you can shoot me uh, an email. You'll probably know how to do that if you're subscribed to the Dissenter newsletter. Um, I'll, 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 I'll feed you the exclusive content while I still have a small number of people who fall into that category. But I'm going to start doing more of these segments at the channel along with the content that we do on the issues that I tend to cover. And I don't need to go down that list. If you're here at this channel, you're probably familiar with what I do. But thank you. And uh, we'll be back next week with another segment. And this will be what we do. We'll go through some upcoming releases, maybe something that's just opened in theaters. Uh, and then we'll talk about a big movie story from the past week. So it was good doing this with you. And uh, we'll be back next week.